Thanks very much, Rose. It's a pleasure to be here today. And it's pretty hard to compete with the robo soccer <laughs> just before um, afternoon tea. And I'd like to focus a few comments on the position that policy has and the responsibility government has in our democracy to contribute to the role technology plays in our society. And I found um, Donald Wright's um, talk really relevant because it shows what happens when things are too tough for creators and entrepreneurs. And it also shows that from a business perspective, it's not always just about um, being a great um, entrepreneur and having a great idea. Timing is everything, and the business culture in a given society really matters as well. And there's some huge differences between our, our business culture here in Australia and that with the US, and yet because we're having a technology conversation, we always use the US as a good example, and I've done quite a bit of work looking at what creates that churn and dynamism in places like Silicon Valley and how it relates to Australia. In fact, does it relate to Australia? I'll come back to that point a little bit later. I want to talk just to start with about um, um, technology as uh, something that we use, something that we deploy, something that we apply, and compare that to what it is to be a nation of creators and inventors. And I know during the last period, I suppose the last uh, 20 or so years, 20 or 30 years, particularly with the advent of the, the whole dot-com boom and that huge phase of, of you know, 2.0 technological development across society, um, that there was a debate raging, and it really touched on a couple of points that all the speakers have already made, is are we a nation of active creators and contributors to that you know, global progression of technology usage in society? Or are we a nation of users? And, and for some bizarre reason, a lot of the public policy debate has focused on one or the other. The answer is, of course, we are incredible creators. And more than anything else, Trevor Pearcy is a great example of that. Uh, but we all know through the telling of the history that he's not alone. And that quite often Australian inventions are incredibly unique, so much so that we don't give them stats or don't truly believe that they're making a difference or have the potential to make the difference they do. Now, this object has occupied my thoughts for a you know, stupid amount of time over the years. And I sort of come up with a couple of my own explanations. And one of them is that when you're, when you're in a place like Australia, we can take all of the inputs and inspirations from around the world because we're incredibly multicultural, we have a fantastic education system, uh, we have an environment that is, is quite unique. So all of those positive inputs turn into a mashup when we do come up with our own, our own ideas. We're a country of early adopters, but we're not necessarily a country where that self-belief can take a hold in a substantial way. There's a couple of reasons for that, I think. This is my theory. <laughs> one, one of them is that we're not very big and therefore we can't possibly be the best. Two, we're not always about making an absolute bucket of money. I was going to say something else, but I'll keep it tidy. <laughs> it's not always about making money in Australia. We have an altruistic character to our collective people that isn't the same as other cultures. And so you combine those two things, that lack of self-belief and the motivation that's not always about wealth creation and technology being a useful platform, thanks very much to achieve that. And, and you suddenly find yourself in, in quite, a, quite a cavern, if you like, of not being able to reap the benefits of the creativity um, for you know the use of society. So that's kind of you kind of see my theory and how I got that. So knowing these things, I think government has a responsibility to try and address those points of weakness in our culture, our business, and our policy realm, if you like, to mitigate those issues in a really positive way. And I'm not making a partisan comment.
I'm not going to show you. This is universal because it is cultural. What we have is a society that can take the best from the world and turn it into something better through our systems of education and experience. What we don't have is recognition that because we're different and because we're unique, just how close to market for our technologies look different here. Partly because for technology, a lot of the biggest buyers in this country are public sector. A lot of the most creative uses of the service delivery are our local governments. Our markets themselves aren't thin enough for the really huge countries of the world to see as anything other than an interesting early adopting and with quite a big profit sitting on top because we are more than the average bear and the average Western democracy. So our status as a market in a global sense isn't given a great deal of credence either by those entities. And we reflect that on ourselves. Well, you know, we're not a very sophisticated market. It's actually the opposite. We're one of the most sophisticated markets. So, what to do? In policy terms, one of the perennial challenges in my mind is that how governments, per se, public entities, procure technologies matters. Why? Because for technologies to succeed in this country, because of the nature, size, location of our market, they need a reference site. They need to have some proof beyond the scale that would normally be present in a different market, a larger market. And so in my mind, if you want to pick a few things out, having the biggest procurer of technology, say a government, choose your solution because it's cheaper and more effective, provides a reference site and recognition of its quality that helps that business then into the global markets. So from a one single policy point of view, when you break it all down, making an active choice to procure the best solution, which is often local, is a really easy way to get started. Unfortunately, for public policy, it's quite hard. And just without going deep into this issue, because I get a little bit too passionate about it, it's very easy for governments who aren't thinking too deeply about these issues of technology to say, well, you tell us, market, what the best thing to do is. And the the challenge of being a smart buyer of technology um, is a perennial one. It's very easy, and I've been in this position myself, to say, what's the lowest risk path for me to take in making my procurement choices? And the lowest risk path is the one um, that I'm told, and that is, of course, the company that has the broadest capacity to manage that risk, and that means the one that can reach to the rest of the world for all of the scope that's required, and we'll do it for you because we're so big and wide that we can. Um, and this, I have to say, starts to speak to why we don't see Australian companies achieve the scale that will that, that I think they deserve. <laughs> I also think it's one of the reasons why when we look at business and business motivations here. And I really appreciate your story. Is because when you when you're a business growing here, and it's so hard to grow, and you can all tell me how many businesses you know that have had good export success before they've had success in this country. Why is that? Business people who mortgage their homes to make their idea flourish and to find a way to sell that into a and ready market, if you like, come out of the other end of that process so exhausted that selling their business looks like a good option. And I know many people in the ICT sector in this country who have found themselves in exactly that situation. It's so hard to do business here um, for the confidence and cultural issues, and it's so tough on your family and friends when you are the private investor it is your dream that those dreams are stolen away from you and crushed. So it sounds really negative, not at all, 
We know these things. It's not hard. And I've been really motivated lately. I'm working closely associated with some defence and national security industries. And I can see signs of a growing understanding of the value of having these what are called interface software capabilities. But in fact, Australian technologies acknowledge the value of inventiveness here uh, in that part of industry policy. And so I think the attitude to industry policy and all that means for these creators and innovators and business leaders who have a vision and want to see it tough come to fulfillment is going to have a stronger opportunity in the future. The Australian government and I can say this is, again, not partisan because it's, it's a, a, a view that's supported across both sides, all sides. Um, there is value in doing things for ourselves if there is a strategic reason to do it. And what we know from a technological development side of things generally is that the trend in creativity now is turning back to the most innovative and getting out of what I call um, the, the doctrine or the groove of what's expected. And we heard a little bit about um, what you were saying of oh, technology that's expected. If you're too far away from that, it's not real, it's not valued, and it's not um, assumed to be successful in the market. So another area of policy is that of the creator. How do we create a culture where that creativity the computer scientists of, of Australia um, feel valued and given status and encouraged to stay and <coughs> work in organisations that are likely to have some success. This is part of our culture and, our, um, and how we view ourselves as well. And for Australia's future, part of it is the celebration of our success. And that's one of the greatest things about the PC Foundation. And what it does. I know both that the, the arts and how we reflect on ourselves is a huge part of that too. And where we go from here, I think the celebration of technology should ascend in that hierarchy of all of the things that we celebrate. And there will be, we enter into another big technology phase. And I know it's been, you know, the year of celebrating the Apollo landing and the role that the space sector played in inspiring young folks um, in the 60s and 70s to embark on these areas of scientific and technology endeavour uh, are potentially with us again. I'm certainly one of the subscribers to um, space and space-related technologies being another huge platform for generational inspiration about technology. Um, it's, it's, it's humans, but also on the path of valuing our planet. So, Rose, I'll stop there. I'm not sure if there's time for questions, but it's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, a 15 opportunity to pay my respects to Herb Pearcey and all of you who've contributed so substantially to the depth, breadth, and credibility.